Actually, no. We're 15 minutes or seconds late. All right. We are going to have some woo clap questions. So I have this here. Um, yesterday was our <clears throat> our second chemistry lab, but the first one that involved chemicals. What did you observe about yesterday's lab? Um, that different things react with other things. Different things react with different things. That is, you put A with B, there's no reaction. You put A with C, there's a reaction. Good observation. What else? Mine's kind of the same as hers. I was going to say that different chemicals have different properties. Okay. You saw physical changes when you had chemical changes. You also saw dissolving, having just physical change without a chemical change. One of the things that stands out to me is how careful you have to be in chemistry. Now, when you're doing high-level research in any area, you have to be chemistry. You have to be careful. But in chemistry, even at the beginning level, if you're not careful, everything goes awry, right? If you, with the dissolving, the first step, if just after one minute you say, "Oh, that's long enough," you're probably going to say it didn't dissolve, even if it's dissolving, because it takes time. And being careful with your measurements and your timing and just your process is so important in science. And you can see that at your earliest chemistry experiments. First Wu clap question. This is going back to the last lecture, of course. Which types of molecular attraction take the least amount of energy to break apart? Or which types is which type singular? Only one answer. Anybody got an extra sheet? I got you. I've got you. Oh, he's got you. Look at him. Thanks for coming. That's not them. Okay, where are they? He had you, but he ain't got you. Yeah, apparently I don't have you. I will print more. Okay, good. I don't. Oh, you don't have it. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry to start class. No, I think you need one, right? Okay. What was that? Yes, it's open. We have three answers so far. And it's, we got four. I opened it again for the last person if they want to put their answer. There we go. Everyone's answered. Excellent. I like that. Okay, so we had one person that said dipole, dipole. Zero pe people that said dipole induced dipole. One person that said ion dipole. And three people that said induced dipole induced dipole. Makes me feel good and warm that we're getting majority answers correct again. Yay. Oh, speaking of. Yeah. Where's our gold stars? <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's like, she's like, like what? what? You're right. It's not Monday, right? I totally forgot. We totally no. want those, though. Okay, gold stars. I'm gonna write this on my hand. I will that way, I'll look. This as the first time we all get something right. All of us. I will get gold stars. I'm sure Amy has some way of getting those. I want Dollar Tree. I want little fishies. I don't want stars. Little fishies. Whoa. Fish. <laughs> real fish. She's Not real fish. Real fish. Yeah. Real fish will not be happening. You can get those at the Dollar Tree, what Dollar General, uh, party favorite shops, or online for like 67 cents. Roche, Literally yeah. Walmart. I, yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking Target. <laughs> I love Target. Yes, we're highfalutin. It's a French Target. store. Yes. Okay. Wow, I remember somebody called Tar Target Target in a minute. <laughs> That's kind of cool. That's what my dad calls it too. It must be a dad. It, it, it's a joke from back when I was in high school, yeah. It's a dad about people putting on airs being all sophisticated. Okay, so let's order these. Three people got it right. Let's order them from strongest to weakest. So the weakest we already have identified. Strongest is ion diploid. Dipole. Dipole, sorry. Jeez. No, it's not a problem. 
So that's the strongest. Then we have two more. How are those going to relate? Diploid, diploid? Like, the, like the next one? Okay, A is the next one. Yeah. The dipole, dipole. Diploid is a genetics term. <laughs> Well, um, you see, I have this disorder called I can't pronounce anything right at all. Well, it is a word, though. <laughs> and induced dipole, well, dipole, induced dipole is the third. And, of course, this was the weakest. Mm -hmm. They all have to do with charge attraction. And so if you have an ion, it's already charged. A dipole already has a charge separation. That's your strongest because there's no repulsion from, well, there is a little repulsion, but just some. Dipole, dipole, there's going to be more repulsion because both have a positive and negative side. Dipole, induced dipole, well, that's really weak because you had to induce a dipole. And then induced, induced, super weak. Okay, now some more words. We have lots of words in chemistry. We, we have less math, more words. So we've already seen this first one, elemental substances. If it's elemental, that means it has only one type of element. So an example is gold. Pure gold is elemental. Sorry. No, she's not taking a picture. Okay. No, I'm trying to get a hold of my sister. Sorry. Okay, then we have a pure substance. Notice the difference. An elemental substance versus a pure substance. A pure substance has only one type of molecule. So H2O, that's not elemental. It has two atom types. But you can still have a pure water, a pure substance, if it's nothing but H2O molecules. And then we have a mixture. Oh, by the way, we did define compound, I believe, last class period. Compound is, yeah, two types of atoms. Yeah. A mixture is when you have two or more pure substances mixed together. So if you, for instance, take water and into that water you pour olive oil, assuming that olive oil is a pure substance, which of course is not really true, then you would have something that's a mixture because you have two pure substances that you've mixed together. Now, there's different types of mixtures. So here's an example of putting sugar in your coffee. Now, is coffee a mixture or is it a pure mixture. substance? It's a mixture. It's a mixture. It has lots of different chemicals mixed together, lots of different types of molecules. When you pour the sugar in, the sugar undergoes a physical change only. It dissolves. Just like our experiments we did yesterday, the first thing was to see if they dissolve. Everything is going to dissolve some really tiny amount, but most of those did dissolve to any appreciable amount. So yeah. if it dissolves, does that mean that it like just goes away? It's like whew. No, it, it means the molecules that were being held together release from the other molecules that oh. they're like but they're still maintaining their integrity. They're still, you know, think of it like you have a person and you have a group of people holding hands, they're held together, you put them in the water, they let go of their hands, each one's still a whole person. Okay. Same idea. So that is a mixture when you put the, the sugar in, you have sugar molecules, over here they were all bound together, here they're separated, and of course the picture is just showing sugar and water because that would actually be a, a more apt example. So mixtures we break up into hetero and homo. Gosh, like, What's, like humans? Like homo sapiens? No, <laughs> no, not like humans at all. Homo sapiens and hetero sapiens. Uh, so. Hetero, what does hetero mean? What? What? what or, like, no, that's no. Opposites of <laughs> you, you're, you're thinking of, uh, but hetero means different. Yeah, it's a thing. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's why we have the terms that, that you're thinking of. Uh, trying to avoid, yeah, to avoid any conflict. Right. What does homo mean? What? One. Homo means one, the same. So homogenous means 
the mixture is somehow the same, heterogeneous is somehow different. What makes it homo homogeneous versus hetero heterogeneous? Heterogeneous is when you can tell that there is more than one substance present. So like if you put oil in water, the oil flows. Right. Wow, knowledge. So if you can tell that there's two things there by looking, not by looking in the microscope, mm -hmm. then it's heterogeneous. If it looks like it's just one thing, then it's homogeneous. So we'll have a lot of examples of homogeneous and heterogeneous here just to make sure we understand the difference. So here's a classification of all the terms we've learned that apply to this topic. We have pure materials that can be elemental, or compounds, pure compounds. That would be something like, you know, something that's pure salt, pure sodium chloride. It's not elemental because it's not pure sodium, but it's pure compound, there's nothing else. So salt's or, a mixture? No, no, salt is a compound. Yeah. Mixtures are when you have more than one compound present. And then homogeneous mixtures, you can't tell that they're a mixture. So examples we have here, air. Air is 79% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen gas, trace amounts of others. You can't look at air and say, oh, there's oxygen and there's nitrogen. Hence it's, hence it's homogeneous, excuse me, homogeneous. Likewise, salt water. In salt water, you have sodium and chlorine. They actually separate, so it's sodium ions and chlorine items mixed in with water, H2O, but you can't tell that it's not just one thing. Your taste buds can tell there's salt in it, but they still can't tell, oh, this is salt and this is water. White gold being gold and palladium, apparently. Suspensions. A suspension. Milk is an example of a suspension. When I say suspension, what does that sound like to you? Like a car. <laughs> To be okay, a car has a suspension system that holds it up, right? Oh. Or a student may be suspended from school where they're being held up from their studies. So suspension is being held up. And so a suspension is when you have one type of particle held up in another type of particle. And milk is an example of a suspension, a colloidal suspension. Um, so in milk, and I think I have a picture coming up that actually shows a microscopic view of milk. I might have taken it out. Oh. Um, but milk has little fat globules. They're suspended in water. And so it's really two different things mixed together, but you can't tell the difference unless you look at it under a microscope. So it's homogeneous because you can't tell the difference. And blood is another example. You probably know that when you donate blood, one of the things they often do is they centrifuge it so they can separate the parts of the blood, but when you look at blood, it just looks all the same, so it's homogeneous. <laughs> and fog. By the way, does anyone know the difference between fog and cloud? Fog is more dense, cloud is not correct. Cloud is in the sky. Fog is <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the definition. Fogs and clouds are exactly the same thing, but if it's below 50 feet, it's fog. If it's above 50 feet, it's a cloud. You should be a scientist. Or at least a physical science person, because that's... Yeah. <laughs> okay. So fog is little air or water droplets suspended in the air. Heterogeneous, the examples here, sand and water. You can tell the difference. You see, oh, there's sand and there's water. And even though they're mixed together, you don't get confused about, oh, I think it's just one thing. Likewise, oil and water, you have little oil droplets that hold together. You can see them separate. That was your example. Or sand and salt. Sand and salt is harder to tell there's because they look some more similar, but here's, pr here's pictorial examples. Granite. Granite has a whole bunch of small crystals of different types of minerals. We'll learn about that later in the class. But you can see that there are different things in the granite. So that puts it into the heterogeneous mixtures. Uh, the snow globe, it's, you know, you've got the little TV boppers that get in the way so you can't see. They're supposed to look like snow. Pizza. The pizza, I love this one, except for we should get rid of all olives. They just aren't good on pizza or anything else that you put in your mouth. 
<laughs> I know I'm a heretic, but you can see I got olives. I've got tomato. It looks like there might be cheese. I'm not oh, sure. Tomato, but not olives. Wow. Oh, I like tomato. Yes. Only that fruit, not sweet fruit like. Okay, but that's not germane. But you can see the difference in the things. That's what makes it heterogeneous. Air, you can't tell the molecules. Water, this is ocean water is, that's why it says clear seawater. Clear, because if it wasn't clear, you could say, oh, there's something floating in it, and that would make it heterogeneous. But if it's clear, you can't see the salt in there. The white gold, the palladium, and gold mixed together. You can't see, oh, this part's gold and this part's, part's palladium. You just see, ooh, it's pretty. So, everybody understand the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous? Yes. All right. So, with homogeneous mixtures, a new thing, solutions. Now, <laughs> I think I have like multiple slides. I only edited the last one for us to take out the earlier ones. Um, a solution is when you have two things mixed together that you can't tell apart. A suspension is when you have different phases for those parts. So water and the uh, water and the milk fat, they're, they're different phases, whereas um, in the solution, they all look the same. They're all can't see the difference. Okay, so let's answer another question. And if you get them all, sorry, you can't start yet. You can answer now. Is the air in your house homogenous or heterogeneous? This is too hard for me, man. <laughs> Be as technical as you want to be. Okay. Okay, we've all answered. And of course, I pressed the wrong button. So here's what we have one, three, zero, one. Okay, so we're all over the place here, but there's good explanations for all but one of these answers so first of all when you look at the air can you tell there's more than one thing in the air sometimes the sunlight's filtering through it sometimes if the sunlight's filtering through if the sunlight's filtering through what do you see dust, dust. dust. and so what would you answer in that case b. b so that is appropriate based on you can see those dust particles that's heterogeneous but what if the sun's not shining through and you can't see the dust particles? It's still there. Then, it, then it's all like different types of molecules. Then it's going to be this one because you can't tell that it's a mixture. Was this a more than one answer question? Yeah, I would accept both of those oh, okay. answers. Okay. I'd accept both of those because it depends on your perspective. That's, that's why Vanessa was like, how technical are we getting? I said, be as technical as you want because I, I'm going to accept both of those because you could, you know, if it was on a test, I would have to give credit for both of those answers because depending on how you view the question, each one, is, each of those answers is correct. Okay, temperature had nothing to do with it. Temperature does have something to do with chemistry, but not with this. And then this one here, because it contains different types of molecules, you can have a, um, well, all mixtures are different types of molecules, but, it could be either heterogeneous or homogeneous and mean different types of molecules. So this is just saying it's a mixture. So if I change this word to mixture, it would be a correct statement, but not answering the question. All right, here, here's the one that I did more work on. So solution, when you dissolve material A into material B. And we have important words here, the solvent. Wait, uh, do you want the first definition of solution that you gave us or this one? Um, well, it, a solution, what was fundamentally different? So, so 
different. All components in the same phase. Yes, you're right. You're, you're right. They're slightly different. Um, I'm not going to ask you for the difference between the two, okay? Okay. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture with ions or molecules. Why ions or molecules? Salt water is ions and molecules. Um, so a solution is a mixture of things that is homogeneous. You can't tell the difference. And the solvent is the major component. The thing that you have more of, we call the solvent. Usually, especially in our labs, water is going to be the solvent. We're going to put things in water. So in our experiments yesterday, for most of our tests of solute, well, for two out of three tests for seeing if it dissolved, we had water as a solvent. What was the other solvent we used? Um, we had alcohol. Alcohol. Oh, wait, that was it. That was it. I was guessing. I was just going to name them all up. <laughs> alcohol was the other thing that we tried to dissolve our powders in. So alcohol was the other solvent because we had more alcohol than we had of the powder. Now, the solute is the thing that is the minor component. So when we were putting water and our powder together, we had a lot more water making water the solvent and the powder the solute. A solution is saturated if it has as much dissolved as it can hold. Different situations you will have more that you can dissolve. Some situations you have less. As you saw, temperature for most things will make it so it can dissolve more. Yes? I have a question about precipitates. So when you boil something, like in the test tubes, the water kind of collects up to the top. Is that also an example of it, or is that different? Um, that, that's a different thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, still, the word so precipitation can, totally works, right? Yeah. But it's a different thing here. So saturated is when you have as much dissolved as you can have. A cloud is actually a saturated solution because you have the solvent, the major component. What's the major component of a cloud? Dust. Water. <laughs> Air. Air. Air is the major component, so it's the solvent. What's the solute, the thing that's dissolved in it? Water. Water. And when you have as much water dissolved in it as possible, as much as it can hold, and if you put more water in, then the water forms a precipitate. It forms, in this case, a liquid precipitate that falls out of the solution. So the rain is the precipitate, this thing falling out of our saturated solution. I put here, I made up this definition myself, I didn't look anything up, a solid compound, because for our purposes, precipitates are always going to be solid, that forms from abs in solution. Now, a chemistry joke. I've told you physics jokes, chemistry joke. Uh -oh. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the precipitate. I think it's the solid. <laughs> you have the precipitates, the stuff that didn't stay in solution. Right, it precipitated out. And one of your tests yesterday was looking for precipitate. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very factual statement. Yes. <laughs> Concentration. It's important if you have a solution to have some way of identifying, you know, how much of the solvent, how much of the solution do I have? So the concentration. And you're going to have homework problems. I'll put up the homework tonight so you can get a little really good. Um, and when I say tonight, I mean before sundown, of course. Can yes, you Alex. use that formula? You will be using that formula, yes. So concentration is the amount of solute divided by the amount of solution. So let's just take an example so we know what to put where. Let's say I have 10 grams of salt. And I have 100 grams of water. Which one would be my solvent and which one would be the solute? Your solute would be salt. salt. The solute would be salt. 
Why? Because it's the smaller component. Well, because there's less of it. I, I could have put something stupid in here, like said I had 100 grams of salt and 10 grams of water. And in that case, water would have been the solute. So if the concentration, now the units of the concentration, there's different kinds of units. So one potential set of units that we could use here would be 10 grams divided by, so this is the solute. What is the water then? It's not the solution. It's the solvent. So that 100 grams doesn't show up in my calculation because my calculation doesn't have solvent. What does it have in the denominator? Solution. Solution. And what is the solution? All components. So it's like all components. So That's right. So it would be 110. Wow. Gold star. Now she gets a fish. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now, I was confused. I heard that halfway through. I was like, what are you So, so this example would have a concentration of 10 grams per 110 grams. Now, that's not the typical way of writing the concentration, but it is a correct calculation of concentration. And depending on what you're doing, you may have different ways you have to list the concentration. Lots of new things. The mole. Y'all heard of moles before? Oh, oh like yeah. animals? <laughs> Most of us have heard of the animals, yes. The face thing? We, we used to have a teacher here who would come out dressed up like a mole or something like that yeah. to talk about a mole. A mole is a big number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. It's a big number of molecules. Why do we talk about them as these big numbers? Because molecules are microscopic, they're tiny. And so the mole is a big number of molecules that has a special relationship to mass. And so the mole is chosen. So if we take the mass of a formula, so carbon, for instance, you look back there, carbon is, is 12 atomic mass units. One mole of carbon will have 12 grams. So if you have a mole of something, its mass would be its atomic mass shifted into grams. That's why that number is chosen. So let, let, let's do a simple example. Water. We did, we did the mass of water in class on Wednesday. Water is H2O, which means two hydrogens and one oxygen. And so hydrogen has one atomic mass unit. Oxygen has 16. So if we put two hydrogens and one oxygen, that's a total mass of 18 atomic mass units for a single molecule. If we have a mole, what's the mass of one mole of water then? We would take the, the if, since this, you said 18? It's 18 atomic mass units per molecule. So we would multiply that 18 by 6.12 to the 10 to the 23rd? Okay, if you want to keep it in atomic mass units, yes. If you want to keep it in atomic mass units, you take 18 atomic mass units times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But the reason we have that specific number is if I want to shift it to grams, then I have one mole of water has a mass of 18 grams, the same as the atomic mass unit for one molecule. So the moles allow us to quickly shift from doing the molecular mass to the mass of a mole going from atomic mass units to grams. Okay, so yeah, can you can you explain that a little more? Sorry. Yeah. So we have the mass of an H two O molecule is equal to eighteen atomic mass units. Right. U is the symbol for atomic mass unit. So the mass of one mole of H two O, same number but changed from U oh, to G. Oh, to grams. Yes, that's why this specific number exists. So that we can change from units of measurement to grams? Well, from atomic mass units to grams. That's why it exists. Now, we're going to use it lots of ways, but that's why it exists. Units of atomic mass measure? Mm-hmm. Thank you. 
And notice this down here, sucrose. What would our standard name be for that? Sugar is the common name. The, 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 the rules we used. That's a lot, right? If we were going to try to be very consistent with what we learned before, what did we start with? The thing that was hydrogen. the thing that was farthest to the left, right? So we'd start with hydrogen. And how many hydrogens do we have? 22. Yeah. So we'd have to know the fruit prefix for 22, which I can't remember. So I'm just going to put 22 there because I can't remember its prefix. Wow. And then what would come next? Carbon. Carbon. And we have 12 of those, which I should remember. Is it dodeca? Yes. Are you yes. yes. Well, because you're into D&D. &D. Mm. Oh, dodeca. You, you don't talk about dodecahedron? No, is it D12? Okay. Yeah. Dodeca is either 20 or 12. And you, you know what? That's why you have smart <laughs> I'm a turn on that one. Sorry, but I am. Dodeca is 12, yeah. And then oxygen. I don't know the prefix for 11. It's probably undeca, but. And we change that to oxide because it's the end. So that would be our standard naming convention for it. Nobody's ever going to say that, right? They're going to use the common name of sucrose. Okay, so an example of a sugar solution. One mole of sucrose mixed with um, a liter of water. Now, <laughs> it says one mole per liter for the concentration. A mole is a number of molecules. A liter is a volume. So this kind of measurement of concentration, moles per liter, is different types of units. What were the units I did before? It was grams per gram. Now it's moles, moles of the solute per liters of the entire solution. Not liters of water, but liters of the solution plus the sucrose. So a question now that we should have our hand, have a good strong answer for water, chemical formula H2O, except for I forgot to subscript the two, sorry, has a formula mass of, oh, I did there, not there, of 18 atomic mass units. How many moles of water are there in nine grams of water? Yeah, because if you have one, if you have a unit, you just need the unit. We're not getting any live animals or dead ones for that matter. I just want a sticker, man. I'll get you guys stickers. I will. I've got it on my hand. Can you make us like a little board like they do in elementary school? Put a sticker on the board each time? No, because that shames people. I'm not going to publicly shame people. Okay. So here were our answers. So now we'd better rethink this because what is the mass of one molecule? It tells us it's 18 atomic mass units. And so the, what's the mass of one mole? What's the mass of one mole of H2O? 18 grams. 18 grams. Well, I messed up. She should have got it right. So if we have 9 grams, what fraction of 18 grams is that? Half. Half. So how many moles do we have? Half. What? Oh, no. Oh. I got it right. Never mind. Oh, this what? I hate this. That's so confused. We, we did it, gang. <laughs> now, 
Here is how you actually do the calculation. This is the correct method. We usually use N, lowercase n, to indicate the number of moles. And the number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molecular mass. So in this case, our mass was 9 grams. And the molecular, or molecular mass, the, ma the mass of one mole, I just said molar mass. That was a mistake on my part. The molar mass, the mass of one mole is 18 grams. And so that's equal to one half. So the N stands for? N stands for the number of moles. So the number of moles is equal to the mass of your substance divided by the mass of one mole of the substance, which you take the molecular mass and change the units from atomic mass unit to gram, and you're done with that calculation. Beautiful. Can you tell me what time roughly you're going to put up the homework so I can? Um, well, it. I'm going to do it as soon as I can, but I don't. I get out of class at noon, mm -hmm. and then I have your homework to put up, other classes' homework to help put up. I will do those two first. It usually okay. takes me at least an hour to create your homework assignments. So one is probably the earliest I can get it done. Okay. I appreciate yeah. that. Okay, molarity is what we just saw on the slide before the quiz. The moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. So in this picture, this has one mole per liter is equal to the molarity. So molarity is a specific type of concentration with moles per liter as the unit. Another way you can talk about concentration is parts per million or parts per billion. Parts per million, parts per billion is, is not exactly what this says, but it's used that way. You know, parts per million, parts per billion should be, I have one atom of radon per billion atoms. That would be one part per billion. Right. That, that's technically what it means. But um, I don't know if we'll have it in homework or test, but you certainly see it all the time. It's when they nice. talk about the pollutants in your water, this is the type of units they measure. They don't measure with molarity. They measure with parts per million, parts per billion. Yes. Go to that slide. Quick question of molarity. Blink, blink, blink. Oh. Just... Um, okay, so but when they test the water, I'm just curious because I yeah. heard a uh, thing. When they test the water, I've heard that sometimes if it's like really bad, they'll just up how bad the water could or couldn't be. Does that make sense? I, I, I understand the you're saying. I would hope they don't do that, okay. right? Because then why do you have to stand? Hey, Jessica, what was the most bad thing? Oh, Moles here. So okay. Thank you. All right, we can go back to Okay. So here is an actual way that they typically calculate the parts per million. The milligrams of the solute per liter solution. Why? Because one liter of water is, let's see, it's one gram per milliliter, so it's 1,000 grams. And one milligram is one one thousandth of a gram. And so if you put those together, that gives you one over a million for the units. So it's really not parts per million, but mass per million that they're calculating when they do that. So they tell you you have... You know, five parts per million selenium in your water. That means you have five milligrams of selenium for every liter of water. Any questions about the parts per million? No, sir. No? Okay. Now, this here relates directly to what we did in lab yesterday. We 
we had sodium chloride and actually, do we have potassium chloride? I don't think we did, but we had sodium chloride as one of our samples. Sodium chloride, the solubility, that is the saturation concentration of sodium chloride is independent of temperature. So if you dissolve salt in water and you have enough that you have a saturated solution, that is you have some salt crystals that remain salt crystals because you have as much dissolved as it can hold. If you heat up the water, you're not going to have any more or less in the solution. It will stay the same. That's why we did the test of putting the test tube in hot water to see if it dissolved more. If it's sodium chloride, it's not going to dissolve more. But if it's something like sodium nitrate, then it will dissolve a lot more. You notice we were going from about here to here. And like we said, for sodium chloride, that's virtually no change. But if it's sodium nitrate, we would have doubled the amount that the solution could hold. So the amount dissolved would double, you would have seen a big drop. Yes. Yes. That's okay. That happened to me too. How can you tell the difference? You were looking for this in your experiments. If you have a precipitate that forms at the bottom, then you know, ah, it has precipitated out. It became super saturated. And so the test we did, we put sodium hydroxide in. The sodium hydroxide would cause it to not be able to hold as much in solution. It would have a precipitate, which actually would have been that sodium nitrate, I believe. Last topic of the day, soaps and detergents. Right about now, you should be very aware what steps are the best steps for avoiding coronavirus. Washing your hands. Washing your hands. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. Frequently sanitize things that are touched by people. I I want to just be honest. We should be um, doing this before coronavirus, and I'm a little bit sad we didn't. Yeah, y'all should have already been doing this. Yeah, I know. I've seen the memes. You know what? Even without virus, you can be doing these things. What's the grind? What's the grind? Grind things like dirt, oil. So, by the way, because it is an important topic, why are we worried about coronavirus? Yeah, it's got a little more value. It's going to kill us. Well, honestly, you tell me because I've been wondering. Why my teacher is going to wait this morning? Really? I don't want to see you after that because you're going to catch the coronavirus. And I was like, okay. Okay, okay yeah. Me but but my boyfriend's sister works with the people in Ashland and comes to the university. Well, yeah, she's absolutely. working with the series. I assume okay, which ones work? Yeah, they have to wear masks. Or TikTok? They have to which wear. one's worse for society? Let's answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Probably more people are dying from coronavirus than TikTok. But, which one's but, but let's talk about this because this is an important thing as a science teacher in grade school. You're going to have kids that are wondering about stuff. Mm, yes. So, you know what I'm going to die. Is if you don't do your homework and eat your vegetables, you're going to catch coronavirus. That's what I'm going to tell them. You know what? You're <laughs> going to die. It's okay, hot Okay. Let us be serious. Coronavirus, first of all, what kind of kills the most people each year in terms of the flu. infectious disease? The flu. the flu. How does the flu kill each year? A uh, lot of thousand? It's like thirty-five thousand something. I'm guessing a lot because you said what? It's mucho. It's like in the more than the coronavirus. I mean, the coronavirus has only killed like two thousand people in one month. So if you do the ratio, it's like fourteen people. They're, people they're killing more people in a shorter amount of time. Yeah. They, so 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 what's the concern? The concern is that it came works. from China. The percentage of people not from China. The percentage of people who get coronavirus who die is higher than the percentage of people who get flu. Exactly, and exactly. And it appears that the coronavirus is very transmittable. The number of coronavirus so infections know. outside of China is doubling every three to four days. Wow. That's the number of people that have, have it, not the number that got it that day. Well, people are dying. Can I just say this about getting. 
Hated by everybody, but you already made your statement that would make us hate. Depends okay, on what you well, say. Well, that's good. So <laughs> I just, I'm just curious. Can Coronavirus is like where we're so freaking out about it, but in the '80s when AIDS happened, everybody was freaking out about that too. And they say statistically, almost like four in every three people have AIDS. Y'all remember almost that that that. that. <laughs> Okay, I meant to say three every four people that came out last year. So wouldn't it be the same thing? It's not like we're all going to be infected by it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We probably will. The estimate is by April, we'll probably have like 7% of Americans that have got coronavirus. What? And I guarantee you, I have the coronavirus. So is that what you're talking about right now? Natural so statistically, three out of people in this room have corona right now? Nose goes. Well, I'm about to get oh. it, because my boyfriend. So, girl, y'all gonna have that. You know what? It's alright, the Lord will protect you. So, there you go. Okay, there you go. So, <laughs> we get it. what are the chances that you guys will die from coronavirus if you get it? 5%. Mine's actually a bit higher. Isn't it like 0.32? Like For people who are of your age group, it's around 0.3. Yeah. But you're so women. Is that we're gonna die? What are you trying to say? We're women. But you're oh, women. It's because they're ignorant. So, so for you, because they're freaking out about it. It's because they're ignorant. They don't know. They don't know if they for you guys. It's, it's more crazy. like around a point one percent. Well, like, <laughs> I, I don't understand then why everybody's freaking out. Okay, so yes. No, none of us do. Why is everyone freaking out? There's a couple they're things. They're stupid. What are the chances that I will die of coronavirus? Well, fifty percent. Five percent. Not fifty. Twenty-five percent. For okay. people in my age group. It's 1.4%. Yeah, because only have little, little children or little, yeah. little, little people. Percent means out of hundred. Even kids are probably out of hundred. So, yeah. Well, kids, there's nobody under nine years of age that's been known to die from. You're a viral Okay, so so older people, and older people, men, they're probably going to die from it. Yeah, they're 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 going over two percent chance that Are I will die. Are you gonna die on us? If I get, I don't no. think so. Um, maybe then, I will not. But then you have to consider. Then you have to consider contributing factors. If you have lung disease, well, one quarter of my lungs are dead. You Why? Do. What do you do? Pulmonary emboli. Oh. So I want to compromise lungs. My odds of dying go up. Um, oh my. Gosh, if you, you have careful. hypertension, your odds go up. If you oh, have diabetes, your odds go up. Did so, you have that? There goes I, America. I, I, I have high blood pressure, moderate high blood pressure. <laughs> so you know what? Oh my gosh. So, Can you so, like not die? Please? I, I plan on not dying because I think <laughs> I'm generally healthy. He's still under so, five. So, <laughs> so we still have, yeah. I mean, still, we're still in the 20s. I think we're in the 20s. We got 20 teachers in my situation. Only one of us is going to die. <laughs> That's Are we allowed to keep that all? No, no, we, we all. 